Um, good afternoon. This is Jalamita at NCSA. Um, thank you for coming. Um, we Today I'm pleased to have uh, two excellent speakers uh, joining us, uh, Dave Bach and Alan Craig. Uh, Dave Bach will be going first. Uh, he'll be talking about visualization of simulated white dwarf collisions as a primary channel for type 1A supernova. Um, Dave, I'll let you just go. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, what I want to do in this 20 minutes that we have I think first, um, just because the way we have things set up, what we're going to try to do is give our presentation. And if you have any questions, because I can't really see the chat, just um, we'll ask. We'll leave five, ten minutes afterwards for questions, if that's okay. Um, so as Jay said, what, what I'm going to do is I want to give you an overview of this project that culminated in a uh, visualization video that I presented last year um, at Exceed 16. And I just wanted to kind of step you through the process of how I develop these videos, um, not so much into the science, because that would be for the PI, but just an overview of the science and then show you the very the different steps I took in, in creating this video. So let's take a look at this. Okay, so this was with uh, the PI was Doran Kushner and he was at the Institute for Advanced Study. He's now at the Wiseman Institute in Israel. Um, and my specialty is visualization. And so what, uh, what I wanted to do for him was to give him some insight into things he's never seen, especially in three dimensions. Um, he had previously worked with VISIT and um, tried to do, uh, tried to, 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 to find the, the, the different science meanings in, in what he was doing and asked for some help in visualization. So the basic science behind this is that um, th apparently the type one supernova is created from these explosions of white dwarf stars. Um, but what causes the explosions is the big question that they wanted to try to answer. Um, and they think that direct collisions of the white dwarf stars at very, very high velocities could be the, the reason for these thermonuclear explosions. And if indeed supernova is created from these explosions, then you would see this nickel uh, distribution. And so the idea behind his simulation is if we could show that nickel being created during the, or right after the, the collision and during the thermonuclear explosion, then it might lead to uh, the, the link between the supernova and the collisions of the stars. So this was the data that, uh, that I received. It was 3D AMR data and flash HDF5. And this, this contained a very number of blocks. So each one of these tiny little blocks that you see in, these, in, these slide, in this slide here in both these images were about 16 cubed, each of them. And they varied from you know, right before the, when the explosion finished, you know, five blocks of data to over 140,000 individual blocks of data. And so the three scalar variables that we were working with and wanting to see was density, temperature, and nickel, but more importantly, the relationship between some of these. It's one thing just to show, you know, some slice planes and some volume renderings of individual variables, but because of this link between the nickel and the explosion and the temperature and the density, you know, how can we show the relationship when this is formed and how it's formed and within this 3D space, how it's formed. So what you see on the left is, you know, the camera far away and most of the interest with the collisions is deep within the AMR grid, which we saw on the right here. So the first work that a lot of the, uh, any visualization person does up front is just a lot of data conversion. So I have a custom rendering and animation system that I've been writing over the years that I use for these. So I have a custom format, which is just, you know, raw binary format uh, to convert the HDF5 flash data into the format I use. Um, and then to save processing time, a lot of these blocks that you saw over here, so a lot of these blocks here, really all, every single data value in some of these blocks just had minimum data values or really no data at all um, outside of the interest areas. So the first thing was just removing those. And then finally, the most difficult part of this was converting from the HDF5 format he had, which was cell-centered to node-centered, um, because that's the, the, the format that I use in my rendering system. So the first thing I like to do when I get a, a large data set like this is just do a couple slice planes right through the middle of the data set, just to make sure I'm seeing something that is similar to what he has seen in visit. Um, and so what I'm showing here are just some very early slice animation tests right through the middle. On the left is density with its corresponding color map. On the right is temperature. So I'll take a look at just some of these little quick videos. And again, this just verifies that I'm reading the data correctly and um, similar to, again, what he has seen. And so right off the bat, we're already starting to see some really interesting structure right here in the middle. 
um, with the density as well as the temperature. I apologize for the security messages. So what I really was excited about was, you know, this inner area right in here, starting to see some of this, uh, this structure where the explosion takes place. So after some slice plane animations, the thing to do now is to start looking at this in 3D. And so I use this uh, custom render, render I have, which is physically based, which means you can change things like the absorption and the scattering and emission and use real world lighting to, to show different aspects within the volume itself. And so what, what I showed here, what's important is I like in volume rendering to kind of like sculpture. <laughs> you know, it's like when Michelangelo started with a, with a, with a cube of, of material, he always said that he knew something was inside. It was just a matter of chipping away. And that's kind of what I like in volume rendering too. There's something inside of these cubes, uh, in this case, AMR cubes. And depending on how you, you know, what kind of colors you use, but more importantly, the transfer curve, the opacity is kind of like whittling away at the concrete or the material to find the interesting structure of the statue in, in inside. So what's very important is these transfer curves. So the white curve is showing opacity in each of these. And by changing this, you drastically see different structures that the scientists may or may want, not want to see. So this first one is the density with, um, as again, what, what I'm showing here, the reason I'm dropping off the opacity in the very beginning here is because this is where most of kind of the fill data is and you don't see any of the structure if you were to show this area. So already we're starting to see the collision. So we see these white dwarfs start and this area inside this ignition zone, uh, uh, which really shows the the, uh, again, the, the structure of the collision itself. If we change this opacity curve, you really start to see even more interesting types of structures inside. So specifically, look at, you kind of see the, the shock wave. I'll kind of pause it where you start to see it right there. Um, and so in just in, in exploring this, um, it really becomes exciting because you start to see things that they didn't see um, in, in some other packages by just exploring and just whittling away and trying to find some of these. So this shock region, this, this, this wave that propagates out is something I really wanted to demonstrate. And there's something that he was kind of excited to see as well. So right in there is what I really want to try to isolate. So just by playing with opacity curves um, and doing lots of tests, I start to see really what I want to highlight. So in seeing that, I noticed that what I what I what I noticed what and again all of this whole process is iterative and collaborative with the research. What we wanted to show was both the outer structure of the stars as well as this inner region that shows the uh, the impact zone. And so again, just kind of playing around with some color maps. Oh, what you're seeing here is again this carving, so to speak. So I'm spiking this low value up so you can see the rim of the star of the collision, and then ramping the opacity so you can. See see what we saw inside. And we get some things like this now. You know, and again, what's really interesting is both, both of the outer and inner structures. So I, I spent quite a bit of time trying to show the outer and inner structure um, by just noticing and, and liking what we saw with this. So the next step was try with, with uh, temperature. Actually, actually, this is still density. So again, just quick tests really to show what's happening on this outside region and this detonation, this is the shock ignition zone inside. So that led to looking at this outer structure with this gray area. I started to think about um, what would it look like if we just turn the, you know, turn the camera so I just see the outside of the stars and don't look at the inside for now. And by doing this, I, we really saw some incredible structure in terms of explosions. So Right about there, look at all this structure here, and it really shows you know, the, the impact of, of showing this from the outside. So we knew at this point we wanted to show both. We wanted to show this incredible explosion, the shock waves from the outside, and we also want to be able to see the inside structure. So that led to one of our first kind of production tests. Uh, and this is where, the, uh, the, again, the outside, by changing the color map, I spent a lot of time on, if you'll notice this color map is you know, kind of a dark gray, the kind of an explosive types of colors, the fire types of colors, along with the real hot whites. And the reason I chose this um, twofold, one, if you look at the luminance of this color map, uh, it's still a linear scale. And that's important because our eyes, 
um, perceptually, what we respond to is very differences in luminance. That's why grayscale images are always usually preferred, um, you know, like CT scans, MRI. Surgeons prefer grayscale, or even though they could do color, you know, x-rays, they still prefer the grayscale because grayscale has a nice linear luminance and you can see an equal distribution of higher and, higher and lower values. Um, so every time I try to use color, I always want to try to alter the saturation and value so the luminance remains linear or else you're going to be getting into the problems that you have with rainbow color maps where they're not a luminance linear scale and regions of colors will, come, will pop out at you that you don't necessarily, um, for example, a, a value will look higher when it's supposed to be lower. And that's a very perceptual problem in visualization. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen articles on the misuse of the rainbow color map. So that's one. And the second region, I, the reason I chose these colors is because colors in art is secondary. We respond first to luminance, and then we respond to color. So when you add color to me in visualization, it's I want to provide some, some kind of associative meaning, symbolic meaning. So in this case, uh, explosion, dark matter we tend to associate you know uh, moons and stars with some dark matter and so from the outside and then showing the explosion from the inside would be this fiery type of explosive um, and again it's just added for kind of the um, association with what we typically associate with explosions so that being said let's take a look at this is just the density from the outside now And again, right when we, he had more time steps where the explosion occurs, where the detonation occurs. So with this, with this luminance map, with these colors, I think we really associate with explosion. And look at those shock waves occur. And look at all the material there. So we're really excited about this because it really shows off the, 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 what we're trying to show, the nuclear, the nuclear explosion. I'll show that one more time. Again, you can see the shock waves start to happen up both in both regions, it's symmetrical. But when we slow it down, you really start to see the, right in here is where the shocks occur, shock wave coming out. And then look at all of this. You know, and this to me is, it was exciting because this is the kind of thing that, you know, people in the visual effects industry try to do. And we have the data, right? <laughs> so, okay, so moving on. Um, in addition to density, we want to see temperature. So I did some tests with temperature, and from the inside, it also had a real interesting structure where the collision occurs. And it happens pretty quick there, but again, you see the shock waves, these lobes that come out. So we want, want, wanted to show that with relation to density, and then find the nickel. And so here, I just did a quick test showing nickel and how it's formed. And the key to all this is this is all happening inside this detonation area, this ignition zone. And so the, the trick is to kind of show all these together. Um, and so that's what we ended up doing for the final presentation that I'm going to show here. So here's the final presentation that puts it all together. And as this is playing, um, I wanted to say one thing about this. I think a lot of times these types of videos are misleading because people think, oh, this is just pretty pictures. That, that is concerning to me. And they're just outreach videos. And yes, we try to, I try to create the best type of visual representation I can using the art background I have. But more importantly, every video I try to create needs to reveal something to the scientist. If it doesn't, then it is just outreach. And so uh, this did its job uh, with the scientist showing things that, the, that he couldn't see in some of the other software. So um, even though these are you know, typically viewed as outreach videos, they need to be rele relevant scientifically and, and show something that he hasn't seen before. So in addition to the outside region, we wanted to spin this around and show the, the great structure that occurs in the ignition zones inside. So we kind of stop it when, it when the two stars collide and then show the density from the inside, what's happening. And again, watch for the, the shock wave region that really comes out.
And then again, what's important is where is the where are these temperature differences occurring, and how do they relate to uh, spatially to where the density is? And so we drop down the density to show the temperature. Also, incredible amount of structure happening here. Now, the big culmination of this is where is this nickel being distributed and uh, this observed nickel in terms of uh, simulating this. And so what I did here was show the same temperature but drop down the absorption value so you can kind of see through the temperature during these, sh in these shock ignition values and where this actual nickel is formed. So now we see the nickel form within these regions. And that's the that's what we are typically that's what apparently they observe in supernova, uh, which would verify that these collisions at high extreme velocities of white dwarfs kind of uh, correlate in the observance of supernovas. So, okay, that's right at twenty minutes. Got time for questions? And Thank you very much, Dave. Yeah. Awesome. Anybody have any questions for Dave? Uh, hey Dave, this is Sergio. So, uh, I mean, looks like a fantastic piece of work there. Uh, I wonder about your custom render. Is that like custom, custom, like private, or do you yeah. share that? Yeah. Right now, it's custom. right now it's custom, custom, just because uh, it's something that I'm constantly developing, just to oh, okay, you know, add features. But there is talk about um, releasing this open source or some kind of avenue for it. Okay. Yeah, because that could be really cool. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Any Other questions? So, can I ask a question? Um, yeah. It's pure simulation data, right? Mm -hmm. Is that where the data yeah. came from? Yes. Okay, well, thank you. I think I'm going to turn this over to Alan now. Okay. Um, our next speaker is Alan Craig. Um, and uh, we'll go ahead and I'll let you get your slides pulled up there. One quick question for Dave. How long did this collaboration last? This was a year-long collaboration. Okay. Actually, it actually turned into a Champions project, too. Um, right. The men, champion I was mentor, she ended up working with um, Dorn as well, doing some other aspects of the visualization. So it's, uh, we got a lot of mileage out of this one. An impressive amount of work done in one year. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Cool. Well, uh, Alan Craig is here to talk to us about uh, humanities computing with Exceed um, and the role that ECSS is playing. Um, and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, turn it over to Alan. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm glad to be here today. It's, it's on my policy list to never follow the visualization guy, right? Um, when you give a presentation, Dave's work is always stunning. So I'm here to talk about um, sort of how ECSS has been involved with some of these projects in um, that are coming out of the humanities with Exceed. And also just to give you an idea of some of the kinds of things people are doing and some of the kind of the, some of the some example projects and that sort of thing. Um, so I'm here to give that kind of a view. I think that we would want the ECSS personnel who were involved on the technical side with these projects to give the technical talk and also the PIs from these projects to give the, the, the talk about the scholarly aspects of it. But I just want to kind of talk about this process and this procedure that we go through at finding and establishing these collaborations and how the collaborations go, some of the kinds of things that come out, that sort of thing. So I think a, a core question is, you know, what is humanities? And um, people, people come to me and they say, well, is this a humanities project? And um, from my perspective, I take the broadest view, and I think Exceed does as well, of, and a very inclusive view. I've got a bullet on my slide there about lumpers versus splitters. You know, um, some people tend to lump everything. Everything we do, science is humanities, uh, social science is humanities, this sort of thing. And then there's the splitters who are like, well, this is early 18th century literary, critis literary criticism, and if it's this, then it's not really humanities. 
that's actually social science, that kind of thing. So we take the really broad view and include um, largely what are considered to be in the humanities, arts, and social sciences, and I think exceeds taken that stance as well. So I listed some of the kinds of fields that, that we've worked with in, um, um, in exceed over time, and the list is really um, going on. Actually, I, I've got dance listed there. Uh, that's I don't I don't recall a dance project, but someday we will. I just listed that as an example um, of performing art. So, what are people doing in these um, these areas? Um, largely, it's different than most of the scientific projects in that it's not so much simulation. Um, it's data analysis, and largely the data is coming in the form of text or images or videos. Um, something that, that I see a lot of is people are interested in network analysis. How are people connected to other people? How are people connected to places? How are places connected to um, things? How are events? Who's, who's associated with this event that took place in that place? And these whole um, analyses of, of connections, basically, um, this connected to that. We also see some people that just bring in data and are interested in visualization. I've got this, this data. We'd like to see what's kind of in this data. Um, and then also, um, we've got people that are interested in sort of the GIS and mapping sorts of, of things. And again, not so much simulation, though. Some people have talked to me a little bit about, like, if, if it's possible to simulate, like, for example, how ideas propagate um, and um, also simulating historical counterfactuals. What would have happened if this would have taken place? You know, um, those sorts of things. So really what we're talking about is scaling up projects. Um, people that have too much data to handle, too many documents, they require too much processing, those kinds of things. And what they're interested in doing, some of them are hypothesis generation. So we've got this data. I might have a question that I'm asking of the data, but an awful lot of these projects are more, I've got this data, what are the right questions to ask and how can we learn about them? And one of the common techniques that people are using is the whole machine learning um, approach. Let's cluster these together or let's show some examples. If for example, we're interested in who's the artist that created this image, if we show some example images and some counter examples, then for some unknown images, the machine can take a stab at, at who might have been the creator of this image. So um, where are these projects coming from? Um, the vast bulk of them, and there's not a huge number of them, but the, the bulk of them that are coming in are largely network referrals. You know, either someone comes to me or someone um, one of our campus champions, for example, will contact me and say, hey, we've got someone on our campus that's interested in talking to you. But I get some that are several network hops out from me where they'll say, oh, I was referred to you. And I'm like, well, who referred you? And that's someone that I don't know, too. You know, so that's, that's always kind of interesting. Um, they also come out as a result of Exceed presentations. Um, I go out and give the presentations on behalf of Exceed. I know that we've got a startup um, project coming up that I'll, uh, I've got a slide on that later, that Jay Alameda and some others did an outreach trip and they were giving a presentation and um, fallout of that was that one of the attendees there contacted me and um, um, Jay, Jay introduced us. Likewise, non-Exceed presentations. I give a lot of presentations outside of my Exceed role in completely different areas, for example, visualization, virtual reality, augmented reality, that sort of thing. But at the beginning of my um, talk, I always have a, a couple of slides about who I am and what I do, and the Exceed slides are right up front, and I invite people that if they or anyone else knows of people that would be interested in these kinds of resources to, to be sure and contact me. And I've got a slide example later on um, where that happened, where someone was in the audience for that talk and said, you know, you need to talk to my wife, and um, he put me in contact with her, and that resulted in an Exceed project uh, that wasn't even from an Exceed presentation then. Likewise, there's these interest groups out there. Um, for example, there's um, a group that's hosted out of UC um, Berkeley 
um, Quinn Dombrowski um, hosts. It's like a community for people who are supporting digital humanities scholars on their campus. And so I'm a part of that group. And via that group, I get to know a lot of people via these people who are supporting um, research scholars on their campus. And then when those scholars outgrow their, their local resources, it's a, a natural um, outgrowth to come here. Likewise, the Campus Champions program. Um, I've given talks to Campus Champions schools as well as um, participated in phone um, discussions with them. Um, I'm lumping in with Campus Champions. We also have um, what are called domain champions. And um, we've got um, two actually for, for the humanities area. One is Professor Virginia Kuhn out at U of Southern California, USC. She focuses on video. And then there's Michael Simeone, who is at Arizona State University. And um, he's an a, he's a, um, English scholar of literature. And so via their networks, we gain um, more interest in projects. So what are some of the things we run into that are challenging with respect to these kinds of projects? And um, in no particular order, I've got these up here. One that I listed is project clarity, because there's not a long-standing tradition of using high-performance computing in these fields. So often um, people come to me and they say, I want to do this. This is a method that I want to use, uh, but I'm not sure what I want to do. You know, and so then there's this back and forth, this dialogue about, you know, between, well, what's useful to you to do? What are the kinds of things we can do? And then this back and forth to try and refine what a project might look like. And of course, with any um, project, you've got this issue of data. Where's the data coming from? And um, data in these communities there are numeric data sets like we're, we're accustomed to and exceed but there's also an awful lot of image data and um, video data now we've got things like social media data those sorts of sources but what we run into here then is yeah i've got tons of data but it's in boxes on paper in a warehouse you know or in my office and so there's this first step of how do we get this digitized, which is largely outside of the scope of Exceed. I, I, I say we've got to come up with digital data to be able to really move forward. But then um, there's the issue of copyright on data since we're using already established data sources, which might be coming from newspapers or photo collections, video collections, that sort of thing that are all in copyright. Um, on the digitization side, um, also too, sometimes, People come in with scans that we then have to, the first step would be OCRing as to get it into a text form if it's a textual kind of data. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Another issue that comes up is code and or the lack of it. So um, with some of these projects, they come in and they really are in idea format. So the ECSS role in these projects has been um, edging even towards application development side beyond just it's it's not the typical kind of thing where someone's got a code and they they need help with it in some way to either speed it up or to do visualization with the output or or to um, make it work on a different machine architecture this is like no no code to start with so then it's either finding a package that we can do something with or writing something that we can do something with Likewise, there's the whole technical skills. It, the, the, the folks that we're working with, some come in and they've got screaming good technical chops, right? They're not, the pro, they're not a problem. But then others come in that are like, well, um, this is where my expertise is, but it's not in computational, and that's why we're trying to do a, a collaborative project. And so, so we've always got this, um, this hurdle of what are the technical skills on the on the PI's team that, that we're working with. So I kind of already alluded to this of how these collaborations work. Usually um, these are the projects I'm involved with. Some people don't go through me in any way. And just for those that might not be familiar, I'm in the NIP um, group, the Novel and Innovative Projects with Sergio. Um, and representing the humanities. Um, so an awful lot of projects, I'm their first point of contact, but people don't have to contact me. 
but um, people usually contact me and I talk with them about what we can do, what we can't do, that sort of thing. And then, then one of my roles is to go through, exceed and bring in outside expertise that's gonna be beneficial. Um, these CSS um, technical folks are doing the heavy lifting on these projects. Um, they're often, um, we've, we've um, as we're developing a startup proposal or an XRAC proposal, we even name specifically, these are the folks we'd like to work with because we've already had the conversations with them and um, they've bought into the project and they 